Yeah, no, I, I was recently, I, actually, I, I, I've come straight from Okinawa, where the oldest people in the world live. And we recently went to the village of Ojimi, where the very most oldest people are. It's not quite clear why the Okinawans live so long whether it's something in the air, or the water, or what they eat. But uh, they, 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 they do live a long time, and this village was absolutely wonderful, and it was a sort of complete testimony to the importance of renewal of oneself. Because the, there are very, very few paddy fields left in Okinawa anymore, because the rice doesn't grow there very well, and no one uses tummy mats anymore. Uh, but, they still do flower arranging. So, the, 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 the paddy fields now grow irises for flower arranging, instead of tatami for the matting, or rice for eating. And I thought that was very good. Now, the other thing I'd learned in Okinawa was about seaweed. As you know, the Japanese eat a great deal of seaweed. And the interesting thing about this, I bet that hardly any of you have heard of Kathleen Mary Drew. Hands up all those who know about Kathleen Mary Drew, an English woman who worked at Manchester University. She was fired from the university in 1928 because she got married. The rules of the time did not allow married women to work and teach or research in the university. She had some children and then she went back to the university. She studied the red algae. And in 1948, she published a paper in Nature which pointed out that an organism which had thought to be a kind of fungus living in seashells was in fact the alternate generation of the red alga. It had been misclassified as a completely different class of organism. Once that had been discovered, it was open to the Japanese seaweed industry to put their seaweed cultivation on a completely rational basis. And nowadays, this industry is worth, I think, something like three quarters of a billion dollars a year. And there is a statute, statute to Mary Drew in uh, Osaka, where the center of the seaweed drying industry is. And I was amazed by this because this is the most obscure piece of useless biological knowledge, which had a fantastic implication. I think there's a, a wonderful lesson here for, for us all, that even you know, the accurate knowledge is really important and accurate knowledge about the life cycle of commercially important seaweeds can be important. Now, maybe you, know, you don't care about seaweed, you don't like seaweed, but uh, you, and it's true. Uh, the supermarkets in Japan have an amazing variety of seaweeds. It's really very interesting, and they're pretty good, actually. I, I, sort of, I sort of like them. I've learned how to make dashi and things like that. Anyway, that's really by the by. But I did want to mention this, because I think we may say the big data, but I think still small things like that, working out the life cycle of obscure organisms, you just never know when something is going to be important. That's the, that's the thing about it. So the, the message, I think, is to keep studying those weird things, because you just never know. Um, Science is said to be a sort of a knowledge-based thing. It's not a knowledge-based thing. It's an ignorance-based thing. We don't know where we're going most of the time, and it's finding stuff out which is what's important. So uh, I, I put this in because uh, some of you, I think, work on coelacanths, <laughs> or have worked on coelacanths. I know at least one. Um, and I feel like that because I really haven't, I mean, you know, I, <laughs> this, is, this is me now, okay. <laughs> and another, another nice thing, so I, 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 for many years I belonged to the Department of Biochemistry in Cambridge. 
And in the 1930s, it was a very lively place. It wasn't really so lively now. And they had a house magazine. And this was one of a series of sort of uh, fake advertisements. I don't know who put it out. They were an interesting lot then. They were very left-wing. I mean, most of them were actually communists. Um, and this is actually one of the problems of biochemistry demand fresh solutions. But we have no use for moldy old buffers. Now, actually, there's a, there's, a, there's a joke. I'm not sure how many of you realize that moldy old buffers refer to old men like me. <laughs> An old buffer is somebody who is, you know, past his prime. <laughs> anyway. Um, so my involvement and the, the sort of reason I'm here really started out a very long time ago. I, the very first scientific meeting I ever went to was about a quarter of a mile from the department. And it was a, a, a meeting devoted really to, the, to celebrate Max Perutz's um, achievements. And it was all about hemoglobin. And two talks made a really changed my life. The, the first was an introductory lecture by this man here, who is called Henry Borsuk. And Borsuk had discovered that uh, globin synthesis required heme. Um, obviously, hemoglobin synthesis requires heme, but the, his important discovery was that the synthesis of the protein was regulated by heme. Actually, by iron is what he did. And Vernon Ingram then gave a much more modern talk. Oh, he also then, I mean, this is very bizarre. Uh, 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 Borsuk's talk was entitled Early Development of the Echinoid, that's a sea urchin egg, compared with erythropoiesis. Well, red cells and sea urchin eggs have very little in common, although they are, it is true, both round. <laughs> <laughs> But, you know, one has a nucleus and is at the beginning of its life, and the other one doesn't have a nucleus and is at the end of its life. But anyway. <laughs> but Borsuk also mentioned a, a, a key fact, which was that when sea urchin eggs are fertilized, they activate protein synthesis. And that was when the first time I'd heard of, about this. So that sort of um, really sort of planted these two seeds because, as you'll see, the, 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 these were the two things that I've, the only two things that I've worked on. So it must have somehow deeply embedded in my consciousness. Uh, Vernon Ingram set me on the right track because he was actually studying the coordination of heme and globin synthesis. Here's half a hemoglobin molecule with the hemes nestling in the thing. And I won't go into the thing, but basically, um, um, Ingram gave a talk which was very inspiring to a young beginning graduate student, but when we got back to the lab, we realized that he, a very famous scientist, he was the person who discovered the chemical basis of sickle cell anemia, had got it wrong. He had completely, 180 degrees, misinterpreted his data. And this is where I can't quite reconstruct it because Arrogantly, we youngsters decided we would set him right. I mean, it seems an extraordinary thing to mean now, but I mean, that is actually what, what happened. We thought it, his idea was so interesting that it was worth following up, and we also realized that we could do it better than he had done it. So, you know, just minor technical improvements have made all the, all the difference. And in this, I was helped by two very uh, by two contemporaries of mine. Um, one, Lou Reichart, who has become subsequently a very distinguished neurobiologist. I like this photo of Lou because he's pointing at something. You can't see what that something is. But it is, in fact, a rock that he took from the top of Mount Everest, which he climbed without oxygen. <laughs> he's a very, very fine mountaineer as a very fine scientist. And he shared the same bench as me um, as a graduate student. He'd come from Harvard, and he knew how to make these cells. These are rabbit reticulocytes. And actually, Lou was trying to uh, work out the effects of heme on globin synthesis and failed miserably, whereas uh, Tony and I uh, succeeded later. Lou went back to Stanford University after a year. Uh, and, uh, but he, he, he taught us how to make these things. Tony joined the lab a, a year later, and he and I sort of worked together for our PhD. And that was very lucky. I couldn't have done it by myself at all. Um, 
and the two of us made a very good team. One of the lessons I think I've learned in a long scientific life is, is that um, you know, it's always better to have more than one person. It's very difficult to work on your own. Anyway, uh, the basic story then evolved and the, 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 the PhD was about the distribution of ribosomes along messenger RNA, and I won't go into that. And then, but I discovered this business that if you leave out, this is really quite Borsuk's thing, you leave out the heme, protein synthesis stops. Put in heme, protein synthesis goes on. If you leave it out to begin with and then add it back, you get these sort of funny family of curves. Anyway, the, the, the control is reversible in this cell-free system. And for many years, we, we, we worked hard to figure out what the basis of the control was. And it took a long time. I think it took us almost 10 years, actually, to, to work that out. So I won't go through all the twists and turns. It's not the subject of today at all. But basically, what we discovered uh, was that it was a protein kinase, or actually a family of protein kinases, that when activated by a variety of things, can turn off protein synthesis. And this was, a, a, this was really quite an important discovery, and it was my first encounter with protein kinases. And in retrospect, you know, we could sort of see um, how stupid we'd been all those years, and we could have got to the right answer much, much more quickly if we'd only known what the answer is. And I think that's a feature of, in my experience, of biological research. When you're sort of looking at it, you know it's extremely foggy and uncertain. You're relying on facts, not all of which are true or not all of which you correctly interpret. But when, it, when you actually get it right, it all sort of somehow goes, whoa, whoa, falls into place. And uh, then you, you know you've got the right answer, because only the right answer will explain this bizarre mixture of uh, seemingly unrelated facts. So th this was very, very satisfying. And in a way, this was the first time I would say that I really tasted blood, scientifically speaking. And the taste of scientific blood is very addictive. I think it's sort of what keeps you going actually. It doesn't happen very often, maybe once every 10 years, but it's enough to keep you going. So um, armed with this great success, we organized a meeting on translational control in Cambridge. And remembering Borsuk's talk about the sea urchins, I invited Tom Humphreys from Hawaii to come to the meeting to tell us what was presently known 10 years later about the control of protein synthesis and sea urchin eggs. Now, I didn't know that Tom was a bicycle enthusiast. And when he got to Cambridge, he said, can I, do you know where I could go to rent a bicycle? And I said, no, I don't think there's anywhere that rents bicycles. No, it would be easy, but then it wasn't. So I lent him my bicycle and told him where to go for a cycle ride. And so we became friends based on this completely sort of random, I mean, I think the other lesson is that Life is a series of random chances, and you have to grab them when they come along. So uh, Tom, then at the end of the meeting, he, you know, we got on rather well because of this common shared like of cycling. Uh, he said, uh, would you like to come and teach in Woods Hole next summer? Because I'm the director of the embryology course. I didn't know this when I invited him, of course. And you know, maybe we could do some experiments, because he worked on protein synthesis and sea urchinics. We could do some experiments together. So I, of course, leapt at the chance and went there. And uh, the first year was a complete disaster, because it turned out they had none of the things you need to study protein synthesis. You didn't have adequate refrigerators. You need minus 80 freezers or liquid nitrogen to preserve things. You need gel apparatus is to analyze the protein synthesis and so on and so forth. So uh, we spend most of our time fertilizing the eggs of every known phylum. That was what the embryology force. And week after week, you know, you took a new phylum and fertilized it and watched what happens for the first week of development. <laughs> and little dissecting microscope. It's very nice. I mean, you learned lots of weird things about weird organisms. I mean, that was okay, but you couldn't do any molecular biology or even sort of simple, <laughs> simplest kind of physiology. But in the evenings, you know, we went dancing, and because this is Woods Hole, and there was a particular 
guy there, he was an Elvis impersonator. He couldn't, he could only sing slow Elvis songs. But we became, the whole class became a kind of groupie of his. And so the, my, my recollection of that summer is sort of eating, drinking, eating pizza at about 11 o'clock at night because we got hungry and drinking beer and going out dancing at least part of the week. And um, it, it was an interesting course because I, the, my main buddy there was a guy um, called Stan Cohen who had discovered epidermal growth factors. And Stan and I used to play tennis together in the, in the evening and go, go cycling at the, the weekends. And um, he, he, he won the Nobel Prize sometime later. And I like to think that I had some role in that because he discovered that the EGF receptor was a protein kinase. He was a bit stuck at the time, I'll tell you some funny stories about that. Okay. Anyway, uh, so I thought it was a complete waste of time, vowed never to go back, missed it terribly uh, the following summer, and I wasn't invited back because it was going to be the embryology course now focused on something much more developmental, and what did I, I knew nothing about developmental biology. But in 79, I had the good fortune to, I must have made, done something right, I got invited back again. And I'd missed it so much that I wanted to go back very much. And uh, here I am, sitting in almost the front row. And behind me is Eric Rosenthal, and there is Joan Ruderman, and there is Andrew Murray. And that is Tom, who, alas, is no longer with us. He died of cancer, I think, last year. Uh, Matt Winkler became a millionaire by setting up a company that sold RNA. <laughs> And Jerry Rubin is the second in command of the Howard Hughes. So we were actually a pretty distinguished lot without knowing it. I mean, again, we did quite a lot of dancing and beer drinking and pizza eating and stuff like that. But it was, it was, I mean, let me say, take this opportunity of saying about Woods Hole, which is a fantastic center of marine uh, biology. Um, <laughs> But it's a place where, you know, it's a mixing place. Now, I don't know whether this place here still has this role, but it used to be very much of a mixing place. You know, my fav one of my favorite scientist heroes is uh, um, Boveri, who used to come here from, I forget, Würzburg or somewhere like that. Yeah, I mean, uh, he, he, he was the person who really sort of discovered chromosomes and their importance in development by some very simple experiments on sea uh, urchins. This paper was published in 1902. Um, uh, you know, and so people would come here from all over Europe and indeed America to, uh, to study and to be with one another. Well, it's the sort of same now at Woodstock, these courses serve that, serve that function. Uh, it's a very important function, and nowhere in Europe has ever sort of quite set itself up to fulfill that role, um, unfortunately. Uh, there are so many marine stations in Europe, but none of them has had sufficient investment or, or the will to do this kind of thing. I mean, it's a uniquely American institution, but very international. Anyway, uh, I was there, of course, to get sea urchin eggs, and here I am. Uh, getting the sea urchin eggs out of a female sea urchin. So this is such an old photograph that you can't see that these sea urchin eggs are a beautiful dark purple color. They're Arbacea punctulata. Here we have Arbacea lixula, which is a closely related species, but not the same. And here is one of your own sea urchins, a male, as you can see. And that is sea urchin sperm. And this poor sea urchin has been injected with potassium chloride to make it shed its sperm. And indeed, as it had been discovered, I think, in 1952 originally by Tora Hultin, a Swedish investigator, when you fertilize sea urchin eggs, they turn on protein synthesis. And this is my own confirmation of that result. And, uh, but I also learned to use microscopes at Woods Hole because there were a lot of people who used microscopes and they really knew how to use them. They could take them apart and put them back together again. And so I did take the opportunity to look down the microscope at the fertilized sea urchin eggs, and I discovered uh, something else which has been known to the ancients, namely that when you fertilize sea urchin eggs, they start to divide. And the really important thing, this is uh, Christian Sardé's picture, is that when they divide, they naturally all divide at the same time. The synchrony is extraordinary. 
you don't have to do double thymidine blockades. You don't have to do any messing about. All you have to do is to add the eggs to the sperm and make sure they get mixed up quickly. And they all divide uh, first time about an hour, second time about every half hour, within about five minutes of one another. I mean, it's absolutely amazing. Um, and unfortunately, I couldn't for the life of me figure out how protein synthesis was turned on. And that summer, the summer of 79 I've shown you, I, say, I, did, I, I pointed out Joan and Eric, and they were working on clams following up an observation that had been made the previous summer by a, a Greek scientist, Fotis Kapatos, the first president of the ERC. And what Fotis had discovered, clam actually, they, although they lay eggs, if you count eggs as a thing that are fertilized, those eggs are actually oocytes. They haven't yet completed meiosis. And fertilization triggers a resumption of, of meiosis. These are actually, I'm sorry, I don't have a picture of um, clam eggs. These are starfish eggs. But I want to show you, they look exactly the same. You couldn't possibly tell that they weren't clam eggs. I, didn't, I, don't, I, don't want to, I don't want to lie to you. Amazing, so beautiful. And then first meiosis. Do you see that, that little fella? <laughs> Do it again. It's extraordinary, that. This is, this is actually triggered by a hormone, one metal adenine. And the contents of the nucleus mix with the cytoplasm, and uh, they do meiosis. And this little thing here is the first polar body. You can see that. Oh, OK. So in clams, what happened, and this is what Fotis and we, we, we confirmed, and I helped Eric with these experiments, and we showed that actually, so that when they're fertilized, they start making, it's sort of terribly obvious, these are really three abundant proteins, which we imaginatively call proteins A, protein B, and protein C, without knowing what they were. Uh, and you can see they're not made in the unfertilized aerocytes, but it was very easy to show that actually they were present. So this is a wonderful example of translational control, which had been popularized by a Russian scientist called Alexander Spiri. And he coined the term masked messenger RNA. And uh, we thought this was really interesting. We wanted to know how these messages were masked. Something, again, we never did actually find out. But looking at that, we sort of wondered, why did the clans not make these before <coughs> fertilization and suddenly make them very strongly after fertilization, and of course, we had no idea. I mean, you know, you could think of lots and lots of reasons. And so it was hardly worth bothering to think about, actually. But I mean, you know, the question was lodged in the, in the mind. And the question was sort of sharpened, in a way, by a, another talk that I heard. I, I think it's, in, I, you know, I'm not sure that people take talks seriously enough these days. <laughs> Most of them, it's true, are terribly boring. But every so often, there's a talk that really makes an impression on you. And this was another one such. So John Gerhardt, a very distinguished scientist, Berkeley professor, came and talked about maturation promoting factor, MPF. And I'll show you now a little, this is a little movie. It's not terribly dramatic, but um, never mind. You add progesterone to these frog oocytes. Remember, frog oocytes are the precursors to eggs. You take them out of a female frog bite little dissection, you can sew the female frog up again, and she, she, she survives. Add some progesterone, and uh, watch what happens. A white spot for it. Again, not terribly dramatic, but very important, because if you look underneath the white spot, you find uh, before there was a nucleus, just like those uh, starfish oocytes I showed you, afterwards, there is a second meiotic spindle <coughs> with chromosomes lined up. And that's what progesterone does. It causes really going through, it, it triggers a resumption of meiosis. It triggers a G2 to M transition, we would say, in cell cycle terms. And what a few years before Mizui had found, a Japanese postdoc working in Yale, was that what progesterone did was to activate an enzyme that catalyzed cell division. And John had been trying to purify that enzyme without very much success. It turned out to be terribly unstable. It went away. It's the minute you start to try to purify it, it just sort of seemed to disappear. You just you know, have to dilute the solution, and it disappeared. And I thought, wow, this is amazing. How can there be an enzyme that catalyzes a cell cycle 
transition. What a delicious problem. I really wish I worked on this, but I didn't work on it. And, but it, you know, I, I, it sort of, and you know, there were one or two little clues like um, when this maturation took place, there was an increase in protein phosphorylation, and ATP did slightly stabilize the, the MPF, made it go one step further in the purification. But I thought, you know, and so we vaguely wondered whether it would be worthwhile looking to see whether sea urchins had MPF. And along the way, it was discovered that MPF levels oscillate, not just in meiosis, but also subsequently in the mitotic divisions that characterize these rapid early division cycles. Every time the cells are actually in mitosis, MPF is high, while they're synthesizing DNA in between MPF cannot. And then um, it was discovered by, uh, again, a Japanese group that starfish oocytes had MPF in them. And it wasn't for some time that actually, this is my daughter Aggie, quite a long time ago, that human cells have MPF. So if you take any cell when it's dividing, it doesn't matter whether it's a yeast or a human or somewhere in between, you can find <coughs> MPF. And it, the amazing thing is that MPF works across species. So frog MPF will work in human cells, human MPF. So there's something very fundamental, an enzyme that catalyzes cell division. What the hell is it? So I didn't really, uh, you know, I mean, I, it would have been fun to work on MPF, but no one didn't dare try it. So baffled, I started re going to the library, and I found this book by Jacques Loeb, and it had some clues in it about sea urchin egg fertilization. But you see the title, Artificial Parthenogenesis. I was intrigued by the idea that you could take a sea urchin egg and just put sort of things like ammonia or dilute soap solutions, and that would actually get the eggs going. And I think I was sort of in, partly inspired because I'd had a very, my, my parents were both very religious and almost Catholic, actually, a sort of very high church. So I. I was kind of interested in this concept of parthenogenesis because it was actually an article of faith, you know? Uh, and um, here is the Virgin Mary being parthenogenetically activated by the Holy Spirit. So I, and then I read a paper, I think it was by Tom Humphreys, which suggested that parthenogenetically activated eggs have something funny about their protein synthesis. So I did an experiment to investigate artificial parthenogenesis and the patterns of protein synthesis. And this is the uh, experiment. Um, very, very, very simple experiment. You take some sea urchin eggs. When you're sure they're all fertilized, you add some S35 methionine to label their newly synthesized proteins. And then you take samples every five minutes or every 10 minutes, and you see what happens. And, and, and the answer was that the parthenogenetically activated eggs look just the same as the really fertilized eggs at these early times, this is before up to the first division. But I noticed this protein which came, and then, and you can see it's really strong, it's the strongest protein here, and then it more or less completely fades away. Then it's hard to tell with this projector, you can see it, it comes back in. And see, it's so I, gosh, a protein that goes away, that's impossible. And we looked later that summer at clowns, which are very far. I think they diverged from echinoderms about two billion years ago or something like that. And, and boy, gosh, look, both proteins A and B, which we didn't know what they were, they're both of them these cycling proteins. So naturally, with my interest in cycling, I call the protein the cycling. Uh, you can call your protein anything you damn well please. No one's going <laughs> to tell you not to. So that was, the name was a joke, actually. Uh, but it also seemed terribly appropriate, and it, 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 it stuck. So now, amazing coincidence, sort of number two, the very day that I developed the first sea urchin gel, I ran into John Gerhardt at the wine and cheese party that takes place after the traditional Friday night lecture. And I told him about uh, this result, and he told me about a result that he and Mark Kirchner had got, which is that although the first appearance of MPF does not require protein synthesis if you trigger it by a starter dose of MPF. Each subsequent appearance does. So I thought, wow, 
So this is beautifully explained by the behavior of this protein. You have to make this protein in order to get into mitosis. Once you're in mitosis, to get out of mitosis, you destroy it. Now, of course, you don't have any of it, so you've got to make it again. And, you know, this was the most exciting scientific conversation I'd ever had in my life, because it, uh, very rare does it happen that you see an observation one morning and you can interpret it that afternoon, and you know that you have just made a sort of Nobel Prize winning discovery. Because, um, you know, uh, again, it's a case of it just absolutely naturally explains something. And what was sort of important about this was that, uh, you know, if you read the Bible, the then Bible on cell cycle, the biology of the cell cycle, he coined the term, really, basically, Murdoch Mitchison, who was Paul Nurse's uh, postdoc advisor. He, he, the book was largely about periodic proteins, but he never mentioned the possibility that the protein might go away. Because in those days, it would have been impossible for a, theoretically impossible for a protein to go away, right? I mean, people know about been studying proteases for a century, but proteases destroy everything. The idea that a cytoplasmic protein could be specifically destroyed, everybody who tell, I think that's what's going on, they would just have laughed. And so no theoretical biologist had ever suggested it, even, you know, even as a sort of wild speculation. And I think um, that's one of the things about, you know, that, that, that sort of characteristic of Nobel Prizes, actually. They tend to be awarded for things that people would have said that didn't exist or were impossible. I mean, for example, when I was uh, a student, DNA, we would never be able to sequence DNA because it was impossible reckoning without the genius of Fred Sanger. Um, it would never be possible to crystallize ribosomes and find their structure because they were too big and too complicated. They wouldn't crystallize. You couldn't purify them. You know, not true. So if you really want to sort of do well in science, try and study something that everybody else thinks is impossible. It's very good. <laughs> uh, and the truth of the matter was that although cell division was obviously something incredibly important, and many books had been written on the subject, um, you know, I, li I like this. This is from a book published the year after I was born by Franz Schrader, a, a, a researcher at Columbia. If a dispassionate discussion of the subject of mitosis is possible, it's perhaps chiefly due to the fact that our failure to solve most of its problems is so manifest. I mean, really, this very important topic had hardly received any study at all. Hardly anybody worked on it. Although a few hardy cells had, and of course the basics of the cell cycle were worked out in about the same year that the structure of DNA was discovered. And people, um, uh, Howard and, and, and um, Felt, discovered by some very ingenious experiments that mitosis and DNA synthesis happened at opposite ends of the cell cycle. So, and there were gaps in between. And, but they had no idea what uh, controlled the cell cycle because, you know, they, we were very, very ignorant in those But um, in 1970, Lee Hartwell got started and published a, 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 a his, his studies on uh, describing the isolation of cell division cycle mutants. And he and his colleagues, who was actually a graduate student who made the original discovery, uh, that there were genes which clearly controlled uh, cell cycle transitions. And that was very important. And that was the inspiration also for Paul Nurse to study the different um, yeast. And he also studied CDC mutants and uh, focused on this strain we won. And these were almost the only people who were really doing sensible work on the cell cycle. Most of the people who worked on the cell cycle were completely mad. I remember going to an early cell cycle meeting, and there was a guy who said that um, DNA went away in interphase and then came back just before mitosis. And it didn't seem extremely likely to me, the metabolic role of DNA. And I said to him, you know, do you think it's possible that the water content of the cell might vary in the cell. The most constant thing in the cell is the water, he said. And then I knew he was mad. Um, so a lot of people were like that, a chronobiologist of one sort. But there was a small group of us who, who, who took a more rational approach. And I wanted to find out what cycling did, because I was sure it controlled something. 
And uh, Paul Nurse wanted to find out what CDC2 did, and Steve Reed wanted to find out what CDC28 did. And gradually it became clear that uh, CDC2 was a protein kinase judged by its sequence. But if you made the stuff, it had no activity. And neither yeast appeared to have a cyclin. Now, the reasons for that are because, unlike some of these other genes, cyclins are really rather redundant in, in, in yeast. And in fact, it had, had been discovered in, in Pombe, but was not recognized uh, uh, as such. So we speculated, I mean, you know, uh, and, and this is a note, uh, you know, two years after, you know, three years after the discovery of cyclin, I'm sort of speculating here, and it's sort of absolutely fruitless speculation because we just have no basis for anything. So, we, you know, cyclin is somewhere over here, not, not part of MPF, because that would have been too, too much, you know. But I'm, you can sort of see, you know, this actually turned out to be true. Phosphatase, is it regulated? The answer is yes, we're not going to get there, but... So cl the problem are, what problem? We, uh, cloning cyclins took a long time because we had to develop methods for identifying the cyclin clones. The only, the only criteria we had for recognizing it was its mobility on a one-dimensional SDS gel. So we had to work out um, ways of uh, doing something called hybrid arrest or translation, and uh, that, that took a while. Fortunately, I had two very, very talented graduate students seen here with Paul Nurse, John Pines, the first one who cloned sea urchin cyclin B, and Jeremy Minshall, who worked out how to assay the clones and was the first person to isolate the frog clones. And then, I think in 1986, Joan Rudiman and Catherine Swenson, uh, Eric had already cloned clam cyclin A because it was translationally regulated, and they had the brilliant idea of making messenger RNA from cyclin A and seeing what happened when you injected into uh, as xenopozoocytes, and the amazing thing was that it caused maturation. It behaved like MTF, and we thought, gosh, that's, that, was, that was really amazing, and I wish I'd done that experiment, because it was a very cute experiment, we, but we couldn't because we didn't have the clone, so there, they, there you were. So, um, in the summer of that summer, I found myself in Berkeley, California, making up problems for the problem book, which my friend John Wilson and I. So we were living in this house of a Colombian drug dealer. I know he was a Colombian drug dealer because he'd gone back to Colombia for his summer holidays. And there was a very accurate O-house balance in the kitchen. You don't use that for cooking. You use it for weighing out the cocaine, I think. <laughs> uh, and here's, here's the book. This is a plug for the book. Not enough people buy this book. I'm very proud of it. <laughs> so, to to make up problems for the book, now you can do it at home on the internet. In those days, you had to go to the library. So, uh, John Gerhardt had a very nice library, and I knew him. And so I, I said, "Could we use his library?" And he said, "Yes, that'd be fine." <laughs> and he had this wonderful technician called Mike Wu. And one day, Mike came up to me, uh, sitting in the library and said, would I like to see an MPF assay? And I'd never seen one, so I thought, great, yeah, I'd love to see it. And Mike Wu was a brilliant injector of frog oocytes. He was unbelievably delicate. He was so graceful. And he did all the injections for everybody in the Bay Area. He did it for Cetus Corporation and Genentis and everybody. He was a, way the best injector. And so he showed me the assay. And then we wondered, you know, based on Joan and uh, Catherine's result, whether messenger RNA from frog eggs would cause maturation, because if the theory was right, then they ought to, because they mature, they must have the message. And nobody had ever done that experiment, so we made messenger RNA from frog eggs, <coughs> injected it into, and crept back into the lab at about 10 o'clock at night, and lo and behold, you could just see the white spots. That was a great moment, because then we knew, I mean, up to that point, you know, cyclones had been something that were in marine invertebrates, and, you know, arguably, possibly not at all relevant to humans. But once you knew it was in frogs, you could be pretty, I mean, you know, it's, it, I, for me, a frog is a human. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, but then we knew that frogs almost certainly had cyclin. So we made frog libraries, and Jeremy, um, you know, cloned cyclin. We quickly got cyclin A and cyclin B clones, actually two kinds of cyclin B clones. And if we persist, we've got two and like, three or four different and I promised you, remember I pointed out Andrew Murray, so by this time Andrew was a um, 
postdoc in Mark Kirchner's lab and had developed this wonderful cell-free system. And I promised Andrew that as soon as we had the clone, we would send it to him for him to test. So what Andrew did was to take the frog eggs, take off the jelly coat, spin. This is a technique that's been worked out by Fred Loker uh, when he was a graduate student with the great Mizui, the discoverer of MPF. And if you spin them hard, you get this beautiful layer of pure cytoplasm. You get a pellet of yolk and some floating uh, lipidy things. And in between, this is really just cytoplasm. And you can add things and subtract things to and from the cytoplasm. And if you add nuclei to that cytoplasm, they form these beautiful spindles. And if you then add calcium to that, which replicates the arrival of the sperm, the, the chromosomes will actually do, do anaphase. It's a wonderful, wonderful uh, system. And what, what Andrew did was to destroy the messenger RNA in this system. If you allowed protein synthesis, the system would spontaneously go through cycles of entering mitosis and leaving it. Uh, I'm sorry, I, uh, you know, I'm not a really very good cell biologist, so we use this surrogate of cyclin undergoes a phosphorylation when it enters mitosis. So to me, that's obviously entering mitosis, but you might question that. But believe me, that's what it is. So what Andrew showed was that all you had to do was to translate one messenger RNA, cyclin C urchin cyclin B, made the extract enter mitosis. And he also showed that if you locked off uh, the end terminus, thanks to a conveniently placed bagel two site, in those days we cared about restriction on some site, uh, then the, the cyclin could not be destroyed because we'd removed its little destruction box signal. And in that case, the, the, the extract never exited mitosis. So cyclin synthesis was necessary and sufficient for these extracts, and presumably for the cell to enter mitosis and cyclin destruction was necessary to exit mitosis and return to interphase. So these were very beautiful, uh, very beautiful experiments. And uh, where did cyclin fit in with with Nurse and Hartwell's protein? Well, the answer was really provided by Fred Loker and Jim Muller, who finally succeeded in purifying MPF and showed that it had two subunits. I saw this in, again at a, a conference in Woods Hole, and I, we strongly suspected this band was CDC2 because it was the right side, and I strongly suspected that upper band was cyclin because it was about the right size. And I said, you look, as soon as you um, as soon as we've cloned, as soon as we have antibodies against cyclin, let's find out whether that is cyclin, and basically both, you know, uh, both things were right. So then, then we knew that cyclin and CDC2 actually were. And the reason why, I mean, the extraordinary thing is, why did we not think of that long, long before? Because I'd worked, as I say, on protein kinases. People like Mark Kirshner and Andrew Murray were as clever as they come, and we just never. You know, it just never crossed our minds because the only example of a protein kinase which was regulated was cyclic AMP dependent protein kinase, which has an inhibitory subunit. Now, you know, if you have an inhibitory subunit, why not have an activatory subunit? Well, it just didn't, you know, it's bizarre. I mean, it's incomprehensible. But I, I remember, I mean, Joan had antibodies against uh, clam cyclin B, and she said it's a protein kinase, but because the sequence of cyclin is not a protein kinase, the idea of that was because it had a, a kinase companion. You know, it just, again, the penny, uh, I, I, it's, it, it's really funny. When you don't understand when what's going on, you're really in the dark. And when you do, it all makes perfect sense. So why can't you see that perfect sense bef before? I don't know. But I bet you know that most of the problems you work on are like that, actually. If only we understood. Nature is basically very, very simple. It's we who are stupid and we can't understand. Anyway, so once that became clear, and you know, the structures are now known, it was terribly simple when you understand. The cyclin accumulates, it turns on CDC2, the cell has mitosis, you get rid of the cyclin, CDC2 turns off, and uh, you know, easy peasy. <laughs> but it took, you know, when you know what's, what's going on. Now, I, I couldn't resist, I suddenly found that the, the, the back end of the talk was was this, and I couldn't resist putting it in because I think it's so wonderful. So Archer Martin won the Nobel Prize for discovering basically um, sort of liquid chromatography. 
It was then that I discovered what I call Martin's principle of scientific research. Visible. Nothing is too much trouble if somebody else does it. <laughs> now, this is a difficult principle to apply if one's a PhD student. <laughs> Since, however, it's immaterial whether the work is done by assistants or a machine, I decided to build a machine. So I need to build a machine. And this is the really important one, which I really like. I would like to take this opportunity to, this is from his Nobel lecture, to record here my belief that one should take a minimum of care and preparation over first experiments. If they're unsuccessful, one's not discouraged, since many possible reasons for failure can be thought of and improvements can be. If every conceivable precaution is taken at first, one is often too discouraged to <laughs> at all. <laughs> I, it's, it's right on, you know, it's fantastic. So uh, I, I, won't, I won't go go on, but you know, the, the road immediately head often looks reasonably straight, but I, my experience, and I hope I've made it clear, that the actual road of research, it takes many very curious twists and turns, and luck plays <coughs> an enormously large part in the process. So don't neglect take your chances, to recognize your chances and to take them when they come. Thank you.